I'm risk adverse. I'm very cautious with my trading. I only take on high probability trades, treat it as a business. And how much would you invest in that business? What's the maximum you would let you would put into that? Welcome to Trade Happy. Welcome back to another Traders Podcast episode. Sit back, grab a notepad and pen and take some notes. Today we've got a trader with over 40 years of trading experience. He has experience being a prop trader, a market maker and trading at some of the major banks in Europe. He now helps traders with everything they need to know about trading. Please welcome Chris Tubby. So for anyone that doesn't know who you are, can you just tell us a bit about yourself? Yeah, so my name's Chris Tubby. Uh, I've been trading for about 45 years in the markets. Uh, Started in commodities, moved to financials. uh, But for 36 years of that, I've been trading prop using my own capital. Uh, And in the last decade, I've, I've gone very much into helping others to learn how to trade the markets as well uh, providing courses videos uh, and a book as well and I also do mentoring okay so how many traders would you say you've trained over those years well uh, bearing in mind I was senior trader at the age of 22 uh, I've always trained people up uh, for well four decades but the since 2000, when the markets went electronic, then the way of training people changed. And obviously then I wasn't training people up to work for me as much, although I have had trading rooms over the years as well. Okay. And do you still have those trading rooms now? No, I, I, I stopped them because uh, the I had a business partner and, and we was uh, doing a lot of market making and he was much more focused on the market making when I really wanted to carry on passing on, you know, my knowledge, my skills to others. So mm. uh, that's when I set up my new company a couple of years ago so that I could do that myself. Okay. So for anyone that doesn't know, what is market making? Uh, so market making is uh It's usually for new products or or new contracts that are brought on. And it's a way for the exchange to be able to offer traders two-way prices. Uh, You know, it's always easy to get in of a position when it's a winning one. It's not always so easy to get out when it's a losing one. So we as market makers would be required to continuously put in two-way prices. So a bid and an ask. We would adjust them as the markets moved, uh, as fundamentals changed. But generally, it was just to provide liquidity to a new market or any market, in fact. I mean, I've done it for energy when energy was already sort of flowing. uh, But uh, they wanted liquidity uh, and they wanted market makers. So uh, I there was a big group of us. I mean, we each used to trade over probably about 20,000 contracts a day. Uh, yeah. And then I was out in Italy for four or five years as a market maker for an Italian bank. Uh, and that was on their indices. So it could be a commodity. It could be a financial product. It could be anything. I was actually uh, asked at the end of last year uh, whether I wanted to market make a new product that's coming out probably later this year now because of the virus but uh, to be honest I just don't have the time to do that at the moment. Mm. So when did you actually go to uh, the Italian bank? Uh, I I went there at just uh, 2001. Uh, It was August 2001 because it was just before 9-11. Right yeah so I'm guessing that that was quite early in your career? Oh, no, no, I'd been trading for uh, 20 odd years by then. Oh, wow. Um, 
So when you actually went to uh, the Italian bank, was there any differences in how they traded that you noticed? No, because they left it to me to uh, market make the way that um, I thought it should be done. Um, and I, I used to account for between 12 and 17% of the daily volume myself. Right, wow. So that, that must have been quite a lot of capital. Uh, well, I mean, it was basically, basically the bank's capital, so, it, it, you know, hopefully they had enough to cover it, otherwise, yeah. But, <laughs> um, I, you know, I mean, the, the market, market making was quite easy, I, and, and there's different types of market making. A lot of people these days run a, an algorithm so that uh, they're just basically arbitraging, so when they buy or sell on one contract, they hedge that immediately with another contract to take away their risk. Uh, whereas I was always different because I'd been brought up in trading, I, I was comfortable taking positions. Uh, I would just basically take net positions on all day and just manage the risk in those as the day went along. Mm. So obviously you're trading your own capital now and you've done the banking side of it. What's something that you've seen in banking and in institutions um, that makes them successful when trading compared to retail traders? It's probably the size of the capital they've got, you know, that they've got the luxury of being able to run positions that go quite a lot against them. Or if they lose today, even if it's a substantial amount, uh, you know, it, it doesn't tend, you know, they might get asked by the manager why they lost so much money but generally they just got another day tomorrow where they can trade again whereas for the retail traders they've obviously got a very limited capital behind them and they have to protect that as much as possible mm. so obviously you have been trading for a long time um do you have one year that possibly stood out in your career um for good or bad reasons uh, I've never had a bad year, actually, so probably not for that. Uh, but uh, I don't know. I, I mean, because I've had such a long career, it's all been so varied and different, but always enjoyable. Yeah. I mean, obviously, trading that, that long, you've got a lot of changes over those years. Yeah, um, I, I, you know, I mean, in, in the commodity markets where I, I, I first started for the first 10 years, uh, that's one where I ended up as a senior trader at the age of 22. I was basically running the floor and, and it's, uh, particularly in charge of the coffee market. Uh, and, you know, the, the coffee market at the time was very volatile because there'd been a frost in Brazil and the price of coffee went from £400 a tonne to four thousand pounds a ton and it was moving probably anywhere between about eight hundred and fifteen hundred pounds in the day it was extremely volatile wow was there anyone inside or outside of trading that you looked up to when you started trading no i mean i, I was very fortunate that uh i had a, a good guy who initially trained me uh, and then when I ended up at this very large trade house, there was three or four excellent traders there as well. And, and I sort of sort of just learned from them and it, it just built up from there. And, you know, I had a reasonable amount of natural ability, I suppose. But uh, obviously, it's great to learn from other people and, and hone your skills as you go along. Yeah. Do you think that traders need natural ability? to trade successfully or do you think it's something that can be learned? It's something that can be learned uh, and different people have got different ways of doing that. Uh, if you have some natural ability, it always helps, obviously. You know, you can relate that to sport with Ronaldo or Messi, someone like that. Mm. You know, I'm sure they still put a mass amount of hours in, in, in improving themselves, but uh, they must have had some natural ability to start with. Um, and then you've probably got the likes of, of Beckham, Frank Lampard, and, and plenty of probably hundreds, if not thousands of other footballers that have become very successful, but they've probably had to work harder to get there. Hmm. So for someone that might not have that 
natural ability for trading. What's some advice that you would give so that they can succeed? To learn and, and to, uh, you know, I mean, there's so much free stuff available on YouTube and that. I, I think the problem you can get there from some of the feedback I get is there can be contradictory stuff between different traders. Yeah. So it, it's a matter of, of not getting into that because then people just get confused that one person saying I trade like this, another person saying I trade like that. And, and the, the guy's lost because he doesn't know who to follow because they contradict each other. Yeah. You know, it's not the way I do things. I, I show people what's possible and it's up to them to select what's right for them. Right. Yeah. Okay. So when you're actually teaching the traders, what, what should they expect if you are going to be teaching them? Um, again, it's all for different lengths. So some people just want a one day workshop just to find out if trading is for them. Um, and then others, you know, that have already decided that it's something that they, they want to pursue, then they'll do anywhere from between a one and, and four week course with me. Um, and, and then for me, I think the important thing is, 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 you know, everyone or the majority look at FX because it's very easy to learn and very easy to trade and so as accessible. But uh, for me, it's important that, that the people coming through my courses learn fundamentals as well as technicals, as well as trading skills. So they, they end up with uh, a full kit of trading tools to be able to go forward. That still doesn't guarantee that they're gonna become a superstar or even a trader, but it probably gives them the best chance to. Yeah. So you kind of touched on it a little bit there. Do you use fundamentals when you're trading? Yes. I, I mean, I read endless reports day in, day out, even over weekends. I never stop. Uh, and for me, it's just really continuously staying on top of what's going on in the market because that's going to give me my macro picture and across all asset classes as well. So, you know, I've, I have a lot to read up on. And then... Uh, with that, you know, it's not necessarily going to massively impact my day trading decisions. I'm going to base them a lot more on technicals. Um, I've got my own trading signals as well, but it, it's the fundamentals are always in the back of my mind because, it, it, you know, the, the trend may be up, but there's a sell off coming. And when that sell off's coming, okay, I might be on that sell off at the beginning. But in the back of my mind is I want to end up long on this move because I know that the long term trend is back up again. Yeah. So if you understand the macro and where the, the direction of the market is going, it gives you a bias of overall uh, one for trading, but also for how long to hold on to a position. So for someone that maybe hasn't done fundamentals before, is there like a website that they could use or like what can they do to get a good understanding of the market? Well, they can come and do one of my courses. But <laughs> again, you, you know, uh, there's so much available. Uh, probably some of the like the ones that have the economic uh, in uh, calendars on there, such as uh, FX Street and investing.com. They'll, they'll give you a, a little bit of uh, background. You can go on to some of the major exchanges and find out about the products and the contracts that they offer, which again will give you understanding of a little bit of the fundamentals. Or you can just go on Wikipedia or somewhere like that, that where there's a, a you know a mass of information about anything. Yeah. Again, you know, over the last 20 years with the internet, it's been absolutely fantastic for traders and for just individuals to be able to access almost the same source of information as the, the real pros and the institutions do. Yeah. And do you think that retail traders can get somewhere close to that kind of level of fundamentals? Yes, if, as long as they give it time. I mean, it's not something that you're going to learn overnight. Yeah. Um, and, and the fundamentals that drive commodities is very different to the set of fundamentals that will drive the financial markets. 
uh, and there's there's you know there's different risks involved uh, at the end of the day, all markets are driven by risk uh, and supply and demand. But uh, it's just a matter of understanding what will make a market move. And, and also correlations, you know, what other markets that you can look at that perhaps can help you uh, to come up with formulated and, and strong views of where a market is going to go. You know, whether it's a positive correlation or an inverse correlation. Right, yeah. So do you have like a, a typical uh, trade? Uh, again, I, I just adapt to whatever the market's throwing at me, but however it's moving. You know, I've, I've traded every major event since the 1970s. Uh, and for me, uh, I like trading gold at times, uh, but it depends what's going on with the rest of the markets. Uh, I like trading the S&P. That, that's probably one of my favorites at the moment. Mm. Dollar index, uh, I really enjoy it because it's all about what's going on in the US and I understand that very, very well. And then some commodities. So uh, I love to trade energy and strategies on energy as well because I have much more control over the risk and volatility that I allow in those trades. And, and then some this time of year i'm also interested in wheat and corn uh because it's you know just gone through the planting of those crops and then looking at the weather towards the harvesting etc right okay i don't know many traders that do trade those kind of commodities i guess that's kind of something that most retail traders are not exposed to um, yeah, I, I find more them. that are interested in them these days than than, than used to be. Yeah. Um, you know, as we as we can go back and talk about FX. I mean, FX over the years, as especially in recent years, has been the least volatile of all the asset classes, which again will benefit some traders, but not all. Mm. So, do you, obviously, you do manual trading, um, but do you use any algos when you trade? No, I, I used to use an algo when I was market making because it was more efficient for my pricing and it saved mm. me having to adjust prices every 10 seconds. But um, in, in general, uh, I, I'm, I'm just I like to build position. So I like to I, I deal in zones. So for me, it's OK if I see a support level at 50, uh, how many prices inside of that am I prepared to come to start to trade? Maybe I'll come in at, say, 57 or 58. Uh, I want to get my, my last set on probably around about 52 and then I'll have a mid set as well probably 55 so I'll buy at 58, 55, 52 and I'll accumulate around in that zone uh, expecting the 50 support line to hold. Right and do you close those positions out um, at different levels as well? Yeah I, 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 you know I always say trading is about being flexible and again I, i'll have a, a a target zone where i expect the market to get to but i won't put all my offers in there at once i'll put a little bit in there just to start to lock in some profit uh, and then when it gets there i'll gauge to how much further i think that the market's got in it on the upside uh, and then i'll just feed out into it as it starts to rally hmm. So the strategy that you're using now, how long does it take you to develop that strategy? Well, I've got three different trading signals. Uh, so plus also uh, strategies like uh, calendar spreads, butterflies, condors, boxes, all of those. They're, they're just effectively where you're creating a long short position. So buying one contract, selling another, or buying one month and selling a different month in the same contract even. So uh, it's a form of hedging yourself. So there's still opportunity to make money, but you've got much more control over the risk in that. And, you know, th those types of strategies I've, I've been doing ever since my early days on commodities, whether they were for a company uh, and for myself. But also those trades come into play when you're trading the yield curve across the treasuries. 
or if you're trading short-term interest rates, because again, you've got the curves there to play with. For the more outright types of trading, uh, then I'm sort of, I've, I've, as I say, I've got three signals. So one of them will help show me uh, support and resistance. Uh, another one is momentum following that I sort of produced in probably about the last 10 years. Uh, and in the last few years, uh, there's a, a second one, which is uh, more on the way of momentum following. The, the momentum ones sort of show me when the market's turning so I can get in quite early when that change of sentiment comes into the market. Right, okay. So without like giving too much away of the strategy, is there a way that traders can find those turning points? Yeah, and, and you know, uh, most most traders, uh, and I, I, I do teach this, is, is candlesticks. Uh, even most pro traders use candlesticks. Um, and I, I use them from time to time, but I, I've got other charts that I prefer to candlesticks. I've got two charts that I use much more. Uh, and then the final thing that I've got is one study that is, I've turned into a trigger for some of my trades as well. Right, okay. Um, so, other than your experience, what would you say makes you a profitable trader? Uh, I'm risk adverse. I'm very cautious with my trading. I only take on high probability trades. Uh, Understanding how to trade strategies is always a benefit and, and understanding correlations because uh, I'm always analyzing and assessing other contracts, not always just purely my own contract that I'm trading, mm -hmm. uh, because that can sometimes move before my market and that will give me a heads up of that's going to do that. But probably one of my biggest strengths is that uh, if I'm in a position, of course, the moment I go into that position, I'm 100% confident that I'm going to make money. But then if all of a sudden I start to think to myself, well, you know, the market should have started to move by now. Uh, and it's, it's not a fear. It's not impatience or anything like that. It's just that the expectations aren't being met of what I wanted. And then my gut comes into play a little bit. And then my gut will say, you know, are you sure you should still have all of this? Uh, and the moment that I start to question a position, I'm reducing. So regardless of whether it's in profit or small loss, uh, I will cut probably my position by 25 to 50 percent. And when I do that, it just reduces my risk by the same amount. So, you know, if I've cut 50 percent, I've only got 50 percent risk back on. I will allow that trade to just st stay live for a bit longer. Mm. Uh, if, however, I suddenly feel, well, you know, if it hasn't gone by now, it's probably not going. And I, I sort of pretty much lose all faith in the fact that I'm going to get my profit out of that trade. Then I will be out of 100% of that position. So I won't have any position left. And if I've got the final thought that, well, if it hasn't gone up by now, then there's only one way it can go, which is down. I'll actually reverse that position. So from my point of view that seems quite uh reactionary or yeah i guess reactionary is a good word um i'll put a position on based on technicals or occasionally gut feeling or especially if i hear some news as well because i understand the macros but uh if i i feel that the market's not right then i'm not going to stay in the position just for the sake of it Right. And do you think that um, the regular retail trader could do something similar to that? Or do you think it's better that they just stick to a strategy? I think they can get to that over time, yeah. Yeah. perhaps years. It's not something that they're going to be able to probably do short term. Uh, in the short term, they're much better to focus on using technicals if they're going to be a technical trader. But they've got to understand risk reward and implement that religiously to keep them safe. Yeah. So from what you've seen, what's the number one reason that they fail? Uh, probably underfunding. 
Right, okay. They they think that they're going to make money from day one, um, and it's not always quite that straightforward when it comes to trading. Okay, so it's not like the emotions come in or... Um... I mean, obviously they, they do come into play, yeah. but um, I, I, I think being underfunded is, is a major one. Uh, I always say to my guys, you know, work out your career stop. So, i.e., how much money you're prepared prepared to invest in yourself to become a trader. Treat it as a business. And how much would you invest in that business? What's the maximum you would let you would put into that? And then once you've come up with that level, then you know uh, you can invest bit by bit, but you shouldn't break that amount because you wouldn't do that in any other business. Right. The idea of that is it protects you against death by a thousand cuts where you keep topping up an account yeah. and then all of a sudden, you know, you look and, and your account or your bank account is actually down to zero. What advice would you give to someone who maybe struggles with discipline or the patience when actually trading their plan? Uh, <laughs> find another career because it's not going to work. <laughs> Uh, you know, Warren Buffett, one of his great sayings is the market's your way of transferring the money from the impatient to the patient. And it's so true. If you, you know, if, if you're impatient, you're going to rush into your trades. You're going to grab your profits too early. Uh, it makes it much more difficult. You know, trading in the early stages is about surviving before it actually clicks 100 percent. And then you really understand what trading is about and, and how to trade. Kind of going back to your uh, trading, do you have any routines? Like what does your average day look like? Yes, I, I, I'm very big on routine. So uh, from the moment I get up about half past six, quarter to seven, I start to read reports. I want to see what happened uh, if if I didn't actually trade in the evening session of the US, then I want to find out what happened overnight. What happened in Asia? Is that trend continuing through? Or have Asia gone in the opposite direction? And if so, why? Uh, so I'm, I'm basically anything else that's come out overnight, probably Trump saying something at the moment, obviously, uh, viruses and, and whether there's an increase or a decrease. You know, we're just starting to come out of uh, the lockdown, but suddenly keep an eye on whether that's increasing again. Uh, and obviously at the moment, um, and, and this changes from time to time, which is important, the data that you look at. So, you know, if you'd gone back to last year, you wouldn't even have, have given uh, jobless claims a second look really on a Thursday afternoon. But this year, because of so many people losing their jobs uh, around the world, then it's become a, a major factor in trading and the markets. And obviously you're trading, um, you're, are you trading your own funds now? Is that correct? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, I also assist a couple of uh, funds. Oh, right. Okay. So can you expand on that maybe? With the funds, I, I just give them sort of my views on where I think markets are going uh, and help them in different ways. Uh, it depends on how far along they are. Uh, some of them want to venture into perhaps commodities and they haven't before. They've got a lot of research, but also what they want is someone that's that's got the understanding and the skills from decades of trading them. And sometimes they're buy those traders in to manage for them other times they just want someone that can just cancel them from time to time right yeah um so obviously you've um you've spoken about a reason why people fail when trading is uh down to capital um and the amount of capital that they have obviously there's some prop firms out there like ftmo um, five percenters and all those and then you've got the private investors and do you think that there's do you think that traders should use uh, FTMO and those kind of things um, or do you think that they should stick to 
trading their own capital and then going straight to private investors? Uh, generally, uh, to get private investors to invest in, you need minimum of probably two, possibly three years track record of live trading uh, before you're going to get decent investors to invest in you rather than just your mates or something like that or your family. Um, yeah. I, I would, you know, the important thing is, is only to risk money that you can afford to lose. And if you've got the capital, then you can do that for yourself uh, as long as you control those losses. Um, if you haven't got that, then a, a, a way of being able to do that is to go and somehow formulate a partnership with somebody who's prepared to supply capital. Right, yeah. And do you have any advice for finding these people with capital? There's not that many out there these days. I, I mean, over the years, that industry has contracted quite uh, a lot. You still see the odd... Uh, advertisements come and trade with us etc etc again at my old company we used to do that uh, we used to train guys up so perhaps we'd give them the course first which they would pay for quite happily uh, because there was the potential for them to end up with uh, a position at the end of it so a lot of those if we felt they had the potential we would keep on and over the years some of those actually became our market makers I've kind of got one more question to ask, which is, um, is there anything else that you'd like to say? And also, where can people find you? Uh, yeah, I, I, I think trading is an amazing uh, career, uh, as long as it's right for you. And I, I think that you need to have that passion, you need to have that thirst and, and, and drive the secret is not to think about the money. The secret is to go through all the processes and just want to become the best trader that you can. The same as if you was an athlete, you would want to become the best at that, at whatever that was. And, and that's the secret. You know, Hussein Bolt doesn't run 100 metres faster than anyone else just for the money at the end of it. Of course, it's fantastic that he gets that and he loves it, but... Um, he wanted to do it because he wanted to be the fastest sprinter in the world. And that's yeah. what he achieved. So uh, I'm, a, I'm available on LinkedIn. So uh, I'm always happy to uh, connect with new people. I, I enjoy doing that. Uh, I also have my own uh, website, which is www.masterc.co.uk. Uh, so that's master C for consulting rather than the river or the ocean. Uh, <laughs> and uh, yeah, so they're probably the best ones to reach out for at me. And generally people find me somehow or other. Yeah. Okay. Um, thanks for getting on the call today. Um, really appreciated it. Oh, you're welcome.